Greetings from St Bride's Church, Fleet Street, here in the very heart of the City of London. We're delighted that you're tuning in to this podcast during the season of Epiphany. Do please leave a comment or a like, it's always good to hear from you. And if you'd like to donate to help support these online services, you'll find details of how to do so in the accompanying text. And now, may the light and peace of Christ be with you all as our worship begins. On the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there with Jesus and his disciples. The Lord be with you. A very warm welcome to St Bride's to our choral Eucharist on this the second Sunday of Epiphany. It's wonderful that you can join us online for this service. We begin now with our opening prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. 
cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The grace of God has dawned upon the world through our Saviour Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself for us to purify a people as his own. Let us confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternally, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We stand for the glory. God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace, and in the renewal of our lives, make known your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest 
until her vindication goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of God and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter to the Corinthians. Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be uninformed. 
You know that when you were heathen, you were led astray to dumb idols. However, you may have been moved. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of working, but it is the same God who inspires them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are inspired by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. There was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the marriage with his disciples. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, O woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now six stone jars were standing there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. They filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the steward of the feast. So they took it. When the steward of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, 
and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In one of my previous parishes, there was a man of whom I was immensely fond, although it was all too clear that he was a deeply troubled soul. He was a sweet and kind man, but he would himself readily acknowledge that his personal life was a mess and that he had a long-term problem with alcohol misuse. He also had the grave misfortune to have suffered from a devastating stroke at a relatively young age, which had left him with significant mobility problems. He was not much of a church attender, but he was a big church supporter by which I mean that although he wasn't actually a regular, although he would always be present at Christmas, Easter and Remembrance Sunday, those kinds of occasions, nevertheless he was phenomenally generous if ever the church needed money for a particular project. And when I say generous, I mean it. On more than one occasion, completely out of the blue, quietly and unannounced, I found an envelope on my doormat with a cheque for something like £20,000 in it. And one day he gave me his rationale for this. I'm not really very good at life, he said. I've made a bit of a hash of it. In fact, there's only one thing that I'm really good at, which is making money. So I might as well use that one gift that I have as well as I can, and then put the proceeds where they can do some good. Strangely enough, when I heard him say that, I was suddenly reminded of a radio interview that I heard when I was a teenager. A very well-known pop singer who had come to a Christian faith was describing his encounter with a woman who had dedicated her life to the service of God through working amongst the poor and the destitute. Seeing her at work, he said how ashamed he felt that he merely churned out pop songs for a living, in response to which the woman had simply replied, God gave you a voice. Sing for God. Do it for God. Most of us will already be aware of what our individual gifts are, the things that we know that we're reasonably competent at, or perhaps things for which we have a very particular uh, talent. But we may not always be, be very good at recognising that these are gifts that we can put to the service of God particularly if they're gifts that we would not normally associate with discipleship because they don't feel very holy, if I can put it that way. Making money might sound as if it's the direct opposite of anything remotely godly, but doesn't it all rather depend on how we are doing it and what we are doing with it? Indeed, there are few things sadder to behold than seeing someone who has a phenomenal gift but who fails to value it properly. I was once spiritual director to a woman who was an outstandingly gifted craftswoman. She was creative, she was imaginative and she was a consummate professional. But she was also permanently dissatisfied and miserable because what she really wanted 
was to be ordained, despite the fact that most of the rest of us could see that she had neither the skills nor the personality to get beyond the first hurdle of the selection process. The tragedy was that nobody could get her to recognise that employing the astounding gifts that were already hers in the service of God might in fact be her true vocation. And it is not merely exceptional or unusual gifts that count here either. One of the things that I love about the ancient Celtic tradition of spirituality is that it was deeply rooted in the basic, most essential and most unglamorous tasks of daily life. There were prayers for every activity that you did during the course of the day. A prayer for milking your goat or building a fire or harvesting your crops. Remember that next time you're milking your goat. But the point of these prayers was that they enabled each person to see the world and their role within it in a way that truly was revelatory. Because seen in that way, everything has the potential to become sacramental, to become an offering to God. It is all to do with the spirit in which one undertakes these tasks. Writing in 1936, the Anglican writer on spirituality, Evelyn Underhill, cites alongside one another as direct equivalents, on the one hand, the monk or the nun who rises to say night prayer in the hours of darkness so that the worship of God may never cease, and on the other, the old woman content to boil her potatoes in the same sacred intention. John Keeble's hymn, New Every Morning, sums this up perfectly. If on our daily course our mind be set to hallow all we find, new treasures still of countless praise God will provide for sacrifice. The trivial round, the common task, will furnish all we need to ask. Room to deny ourselves, a road to bring us daily nearer God. That one insight is true of all the tasks of life, however mundane, however remote they might seem to be from the things of God. It is true of our business dealings, and it is true of the way we dig the garden. It is all about the mindset with which we approach the things that we do. In our reading from 1 Corinthians this morning, St Paul describes how there are varieties of gift, but the same spirit. And the spirit enables us to be able to use those gifts for the common good. The spirit enables us to, to turn a task into an offering. And as St Paul reminds us later in that same epistle, in his famous passage about love, it is not what we do that matters, but rather what we have in our heart when we do it. Because, as he reminds us, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And the strange thing is that approaching tasks in that way really can transform not only the quality of our work, but our relationship with the world and with the people around us. This morning's Gospel reading must be the weirdest miracle story in the whole of the New Testament. Just about every other miracle that Jesus performs is in response to an individual or a group of people who are in great personal need. He heals the sick, he liberates the possessed from their demons, he feeds 5,000 hungry people, he stills the storm when the disciples are in fear that they will perish. But to see him in today's gospel reading, nobly stepping in to rescue a party when the booze runs out, 
is odd to say the least. And if that isn't strange enough, the conversation that takes place within our story is even more bizarre. The mother of Jesus comes to him and says, they have no wine. His response is abrupt, almost to the point of rudeness. Woman, what have I to do with you? My, my hour is not yet come. The mother of Jesus instructs the servants to do whatever he tells you. And to cut to the chase, the servants do precisely that, filling six enormous stone water jars with water, each holding up to about 30 gallons, which turns out to be the finest vintage imaginable, produced in the most ludicrously excessive of quantities. What on earth is going on here? Well, note the setting, that of a wedding feast, an image that Jesus often used in his teachings when speaking about the kingdom of God. It seems that what we have here is in effect a living parable, an incident that is embodying and symbolizing for us a very important truth about the ways of God. God can take the most basic and sometimes the most unpromising of material, water in our gospel story, bread in the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, your life, my life, and do extraordinary things with that very ordinary thing. And so it is with the things that are ours to offer. What matters is that we use those gifts and those talents however unspectacular they might seem in the service of God and of his people, and importantly, to do so with love in our hearts. Because sometimes when we do that, the most remarkable and unexpected and spectacular things can follow, because that is the Holy Spirit at work. Amen. Let us now stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that our government may be imbued with a sense of morality, reflecting Christian values, embracing integrity and justice for all, shunning hypocrisy. We pray that mankind will conserve your creation, which is in danger of being destroyed if we do not confront the errors of our ways. Our promises will also be lacking in moral fibre if we do not make them come to life. We pray that the people of Afghanistan will no longer go hungry and live in fear of persecution. We pray for the people of Kazakhstan who are trapped in civil unrest. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for refugees in our land who may be living in unsafe housing conditions while they wait for their cases to be determined. We pray for all those working in the media who brave the extreme cold and extreme heat to keep the world informed about injustice. We pray for the realm of medical science. May it help humanity understand the pandemic and discover how people may lead their lives together rather than in isolation. Are we in a pandemic or fast approaching a time when the virus will become endemic? May I touch Lucy and Terence and Gavin rather than wave to them? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who have lost loved ones through illness, conflict, war, or by accident. We hold their hands in spirit. To have been able to love so deeply can be a blessing. In our Christian community, we pray for the Anglican Church of Southern Africa and the Bishop of Johannesburg, Stephen Moreo. We pray for St. Sepulchre without Newgate in London. We pray for the repose of the soul of Karen Sparrow, who died last week, and for the repose of the souls of Calliope Emeris, Peter Hobday, and Mohammed Ben Khalifa, the anniversaries of whose deaths fall this week. We pray for our Sunday Club children, touched by their insatiable curiosity and creativity. We pray for Joanne, our Sunday school leader, and all those who help her. We pray for Alison and Jeff, Robin, our verger, Caroline, our assistant verger, our staff, our church wardens, our PCC, our choir, and the Guild of St. Brides. We pray for our visitors, each other here in the pews, and the online St. Brides community. We appreciate the many fresh faces we see crossing our threshold, joining us in prayer. Dear Lord, as the days of winter grow longer and the snowdrops emerge from the damp earth, please guide us towards fresh paths of hope, ones perhaps we never thought we would discover were it not for the virus striking. Our never-ceasing faith in you makes us realise that beauty and love are there to be found if we only open our eyes. Merciful Father, accept, accept these, these prayers, prayers for, for the, the sake, sake of your Son, Son our, our Saviour, Saviour Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Will you please stand? Our Saviour Christ is the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever.
Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who, in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of his kingdom, and with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us.
Let us pray. God of glory, you nourish us with your word, who is the bread of life. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that through us the light of your glory may shine in all the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory, and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ.